Hi, I'm Mary, and I want to tell you about a love story that began like any other but ended up teaching me life. Altering lessons. I met Jack at a friend's party, and the moment our eyes locked, it felt like we were the only two people in the room. Corny, I know, but love often starts in the simplest, corniest ways. You're Mary, right? Jack had come up to me, that brilliant smile lighting up his face. Yeah, and you must be Jack, the life of the party, I quipped, grinning back. He chuckled, guilty as charged. We danced, and it felt like floating. The chemistry was undeniable, and that night marked the beginning of what I thought would be an eternal love story. We started dating, and every moment spent together was magical. Whether we were laughing over clumsy attempts at cooking dinner or holding hands while watching movies, everything felt right. It wasn't long before Jack proposed. Mary, you've changed my life in ways I never thought possible. Will you marry me? Jack had taken me to the place we had our first date, got down on one knee, and asked the question with the most earnest look in his eyes. Tears in my eyes, I said yes, a thousand times yes. The wedding planning began immediately. We weren't looking for an opulent affair, just something simple and memorable with close friends and family, and so it happened. Our ordinary yet extraordinarily special wedding. The venue was a beautiful garden owned by a family friend. Our decorations were minimalistic. Fairy lights, white roses, and soft translucent drapes that swayed in the evening wind. There was a charming simplicity in how everything came together. Nothing flashy, but heartfelt. I walked down the aisle in a simple white dress, and as our eyes met, it felt as though the universe had come full circle. We exchanged vows and rings, sealing our love. Do, Mary, take Jack to be your lawfully wedded husband? I do, I said, voice quivering with emotion. And do you, Jack, take Mary to be your lawfully wedded wife? I do, he responded, and the smile we shared was one of pure, unfiltered love. Our first dance as a married couple was to At Last by Etta James, a song that perfectly encapsulated our feelings. As Jack held me close and we swayed to the music, I truly believed that we were embarking on a life of marital bliss. Our journey starts here, Jack whispered in my ear as we danced. I couldn't be happier. I whispered back. The night ended with our loved ones sending us off under a shower of sparklers, their faces glowing in the soft light and their smiles as bright as our hopes for the future. That night, we believed we had it all. But as time would show, love alone isn't enough to sustain a marriage, especially one where the scales are tipped so unfairly. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. That's a story for the later chapters. The wedding was ordinary but filled with love. It was the kind of day you look back on and think that was perfect. It was our perfect, but perfect, would soon unravel in ways I never imagined, leading me to understand that sometimes the most painful lessons come from the most ordinary beginnings. So that's the start of my story, an ordinary love story with an ordinary wedding that spiraled into a tale of revenge, independence, and the unmasking of true characters. But like I said, let's not get ahead of ourselves. There's much more to tell. After our wedding, life felt like a dream, or perhaps the opening chapter of a fairy tale. We were young, in love, and eager to take on the world together. While the wedding was modest, it was the life ahead we were most excited about. Not long after, I found a wonderful job as a project manager at a tech company. The position was demanding but rewarding, both emotionally and financially. I was excited to contribute to our future. Jack, on the other hand, was still figuring things out. So, any luck on the job hunt? I asked Jack one evening, trying to be as casual as possible, as I stirred a pot of spaghetti sauce for dinner. Nah, not yet. I've been sending out resumes, but you know how it is. The market's tough, Jack replied, not lifting his gaze from his phone. I took a deep breath. Well, as long as you're trying, we've got bills to pay, after all. Don't worry, babe, it'll work out, he said, finally looking up and giving me a smile that still made my heart skip a beat. I smiled back, though my eyes betrayed a flicker of concern. We eventually decided to buy a house, a quaint suburban place with a white picket fence, just like you'd see in the movies. It was perfect, or it should have been. The house was Jack's mother Linda's property, and she offered it to us for what seemed like a reasonable price. I took on the financial burden, paying Linda $10,000 because, well, someone had to do it. I saw it as a family contribution, a way to invest in our future. We even sat down with Linda to finalize things. Mary, it's so generous of you to pay for the house. I never thought my Jack would marry such a financially responsible woman, Linda said. The contract spread on the dining table in front of us. 
I'm just glad we have this opportunity, Linda, I replied, holding my pen above the paper. We're family now, and this is what families do for each other. Absolutely, she said with a nod, watching me as I signed the dotted line. But it wasn't just the mortgage and the utilities and the groceries. It was everything. I was the breadwinner, supporting us while Jack's pursuits remained vague and undefined. He talked about starting a business or writing a novel, but those ideas never moved past the talk phase. The disparity began to gnaw at me, but I kept quiet for the sake of peace, for the sake of the love I thought we had. But there's only so long you can ignore the elephant in the room. Jack, we need to talk about finances. I'm shouldering all the expenses, and it's getting to be a lot. I finally mustered the courage to say one evening. Babe, you know I'm good for it. Once things pick up for me, I'll take care of everything, he promised, giving me a reassuring hug. I wanted to believe him. God knows I wanted to. But his days turned into weeks and weeks into months. Trying wasn't cutting it anymore. Despite it all, I still had faith that things would improve. I still believed that love would see us through. Even when my gut feeling was screaming at me that something was off, I chose to ignore it because acknowledging that something was fundamentally wrong would mean confronting harsh realities I wasn't ready to face. And it was in this fragile setting, me being the sole financial pillar, Jack remaining unemployed, and us owing money to Linda, that our ordinary life began to show extraordinary cracks. And when the breaking point came, it came from a direction I hadn't expected, but that's for the next chapter. So, there you have it. The start of our new life together, built on shaky foundations that were bound to crumble. I just didn't know how soon it would happen, and how the collapse would ultimately free me. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We'll get there soon enough. Life moved on, or at least it gave the appearance of doing so. Our new house was settling into its grooves, as were we, or at least I thought we were. Work was still hectic, but fulfilling for me, while Jack continued to exist in a perpetual state of figuring things out. One sunny afternoon, Linda decided to pay us a visit. I didn't think much of it initially. She was Jack's mother, and her coming over was normal, or so I assumed. I was still working on a project when they arrived, so I set them up in the living room with some refreshments and then retreated to my home office to finish up. But then I overheard their conversation. Something I wish I'd never heard, but ultimately, something that set me on a path to liberation. Jack, $10,000 for this house is ridiculous. Mary should know better, Linda whispered, but not quietly enough, it seemed. Mom, she can afford it. And besides, it's investment money. Good for all us. No. Jack tried to sound convincing, but lacked conviction. Good for all of us. It should be good for you. You're the man of the house, aren't you? This is borderline charity, Jack. She's practically a beggar paying for her keep. Linda sneered. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It felt like a sledgehammer to the chest. A beggar. I was the one keeping the lights on, the one ensuring we had a roof over our heads, and this is what they thought of me. I couldn't contain myself. I walked into the living room, wearing a smile so forced it hurt my cheeks. Linda, Jack, is everything okay here? I thought I heard some, um, passionate discussion. Linda smiled back, her grin a poorly disguised mask. Oh, we were just talking about family matters, my dear. Ah, family matters. Like how the woman working to pay for this family's home is a beggar. I couldn't hold it in any longer. The words spilled out of me like boiling water from a kettle that had been left on too long. Jack looked mortified, but Linda remained defiant. Well, if the shoe fits. That's it, I interrupted, my voice cold as ice. I'm done being the financial crutch for a family that can't appreciate or respect me. What are you saying, Mary? Jack interjected, finally showing some emotion. I'm saying I'm done, Jack. I'm done with being belittled and disrespected in my own home. A home I pay for. I was near tears but held them back. I'll be moving out. You and your mother can figure out your finances. You can't be serious, Mary, Jack said, his voice tinged with disbelief. Oh, I've never been more serious, I said, looking him straight in the eye. I left them in the living room, both too stunned to say anything more, and returned to my office. But not to work. Instead, I started searching for apartments. Enough was enough. No more would I be the supporting actress in a play that demeaned me at every turn. The time had come to be the protagonist of my own story, one that would soon take turns I had never anticipated. It's funny, you know how life-changing moments often come unannounced. 
Wrapped in the guise of ordinary events, Linda's visit was just that for me, a pivotal point that shifted the narrative in a direction that none of us could have foreseen. But that's a tale for the next chapter. And so, in a house that was supposed to be our forever home, I found the catalyst for a new beginning, a bitter, hurtful catalyst, but one that was absolutely necessary. It was the end of my patience, my silence, and my tolerance for being undervalued. It was the start of something entirely different, a chapter I had yet to write, but was more than ready to begin. Within days, I found an apartment that was just right for me, a small but cozy place not far from my workplace. It wasn't a home, but it was a haven, a sanctuary where I could breathe without feeling the weight of ingratitude and entitlement pushing me down. I signed the lease with a sense of resolve, knowing that this was the first tangible step toward reclaiming my life. After securing the apartment, I returned to the house, our house, or so it had seemed, to pack up my things. Jack was there, of course. The moment I walked through the door, the atmosphere grew thick with tension, like the air before a storm. So, you're really doing this, Jack said, looking at the suitcase I was pulling behind me. Yes, I am, I answered, avoiding eye contact. And before you ask, no, I'm not changing my mind. Jack sighed. Mary, don't you think you're overreacting? My mom can be difficult, but she didn't mean... What? That I'm a beggar, or that I should be grateful for the opportunity to pay for everything while you do nothing. I cut him off, anger bubbling in my voice. It's not like that, he protested. No, it's exactly like that, I retorted. And what makes it worse is that you sat there and let her belittle me. You didn't stand up for me, Jack. Not even once. Jack's face flushed with shame, but he said nothing. I spent the next hours packing my essentials, my clothes, documents, and the few personal items that reminded me of who I was. Before this relationship began chipping away at my identity, I even took the coffee maker. After all, I had bought it. Mary, you're ruining us over a trivial fight. We're married. Don't we owe it to each other to work things out? His voice had a desperate edge to it. I paused, considering his words. But then it hit me. No, Jack, you've got it all wrong. I'm not ruining us. There was never an use, to begin with. There was a me providing and a you taking. That's not a partnership. It's a parasitic relationship, and it ends now. The air went still, and I could see in his eyes that my words had struck home. But before he could say anything, I picked up my bags and walked out the door, my head held high and my heart heavy yet determined. As I drove to my new apartment, I couldn't help but think how ironic it was that the breaking point in our marriage wasn't a scandalous affair or a life, shattering event, but rather the simple, brutal revelation of how little I was valued by the people who should have been my biggest supporters. But sometimes, that's all it takes, a harsh word, a cold truth, for the scales to fall from your eyes. As I unpacked in my new space, placing my clothes in unfamiliar drawers and setting up my coffee maker on a new countertop, I had an immense sense of relief wash over me. I knew the road ahead wouldn't be easy. There would be legal processes to go through and emotional wounds to heal, but the most important step had already been taken. I had chosen myself over a life of thankless sacrifice. I had chosen to write a new chapter on my own terms. And as I crawled into bed that first night in my new place, the weight of my old life lifted. I realized that this, right here, was the first night of the rest of my life. The last straw had been the catalyst for my newfound freedom. And though the path was uncertain, for the first time in a long time, I was eager to walk it. But as for what became of Jack and his mother, well, Let's just say that the repercussions of my departure were swift and far-reaching, and that's a story for the next chapter. My first weeks in the apartment felt like breathing after being underwater for too long. I rediscovered the simple joys that come with being solely responsible for oneself, choosing my meals without considering anyone else's preferences, blasting my favorite music without judgment, and spending my hard-earned money only on the things that made me happy. In these small ways, I felt the grip of my previous life loosen and fall away. Soon enough, Jack and Linda's financial struggles came to the forefront. It was surprising how quickly things spiraled out of control for them without my financial input. It wasn't long before my phone buzzed with a message from Jack. Mary, can we talk? We're behind on the mortgage. I think we're going to lose the house. I looked at the message, my thumb hovering over the keyboard. A part of me, the old me, wanted to jump in and solve everything. But I resisted that urge and texted back. I'm sorry to hear that, Jack, but this isn't... We it anymore. You and your mother will have to sort it out. He responded almost instantly. Mary, please. I know we've messed up. Can we meet and discuss this? 
Maybe there's a way to fix everything. It was a tempting offer, one designed to prey on my empathetic nature. But instead of succumbing to it, I remembered all of the nights I cried myself to sleep, feeling unappreciated and used. My fingers tapped out my response. Jack, you had your chance to fix everything when we were together. Now, I suggest you figure out how to handle your responsibilities. I'm focusing on my own life. With that, I silenced my phone and returned to my newfound peace. But peace, it seems, always comes at a price. Soon enough, I had to deal with the practical aspects of our failed marriage, like filing for divorce. With my steady income and Jack's lack of resources, he couldn't afford a lawyer, which made the process surprisingly smooth. The court date came and went, a mere formality at this point, and just like that, my marriage was officially over. On my way home from the courthouse, I got a call from Sarah, a friend I had reconnected with since moving out. So, how did it go? It's done. I'm officially divorced, I told her, the words tasting foreign but liberating. Wow, Mary, you've really turned your life around in such a short time, Sarah said, admiration coloring her voice. It's been a roller coaster, but honestly, Sarah, I feel more Emmy than I have in years, I confessed, feeling grateful for her support. We should celebrate. How about dinner this weekend? Sounds perfect, I agreed, already looking forward to it. And as I hung up the phone, I felt the full weight of my choices settle in, a weight not of burden, but of freedom. My new chapter was only just beginning, and for the first time, I held the pen. There would be challenges, of course, but also endless possibilities. Looking back, I realized that each moment, from Linda's toxic visit to my tearful packing, served as a stepping stone to where I am now. It was a path paved with hardship and painful realizations, but also one that led to self-discovery and growth. As for Jack and Linda, they eventually had to sell the house. Rumor has it they moved into a much smaller place, their dreams downsized to fit their means. Every now and then, I get a message from Jack, words tinged with regret and nostalgia. But I never entertain the thought of going back. Because sometimes, the best revenge isn't exacting a toll on those who've wronged you. Sometimes, it's showing them just how strong and capable you've always been, and how little you needed them to begin with. And so, with the ink of my old life barely dry, I eagerly write the opening lines of this new chapter. I don't know where it will lead, but wherever it is, I'll go there as a woman unburdened by the weight of others' expectations and unapologetically herself. And that, dear reader, is the sweetest revenge of all. Life has a way of coming full circle, and it wasn't long before I heard about the dire circumstances Jack and Linda found themselves in. They had to sell the house at a significant loss, a byproduct of rushed decisions and desperation. They moved into a cramped apartment, a far cry from the comfortable life they were accustomed to, on my dime no less. It was Sarah who broke the news to me over dinner. Hey, have you heard about Jack and Linda? I looked up from my menu, intrigued. No, what happened? Well, she began, lowering her voice as if sharing a secret. They had to sell the house, moved into a two-bedroom apartment downtown. Jack even had to get a job. I couldn't help but smile. Well, it's about time, isn't it? Definitely, Sarah agreed. But you know, word is that they're blaming you for their misfortunes. That doesn't surprise me, I said, returning my attention to the menu. But inwardly, I couldn't help but feel a pang of vindication. Sure enough, just a couple of days later, I received a call from Linda. I was genuinely surprised. I had expected her pride to keep her from contacting me. Mary, this is Linda, she said, her voice almost unrecognizable. There was a tremor of vulnerability in it, a far cry from the imperious tone I was so used to. Hello, Linda, I responded cautiously, curious about the purpose of her call. Listen, she began, hesitating as if choosing her words carefully. I know we've had our differences, but family is family. You've always been like a daughter to me. Let's not pretend, Linda, I cut her off, feeling my own anger rise to meet her falseness. What do you want? She sighed. Things haven't been going well since you left. We had to sell the house. Jack had to get a job, but it's not enough. We're struggling, Mary. And you're telling me this because... We need help, she finally admitted the last shred of her pride dissipating with those three words. I felt a wave of emotions wash over me. There was a fleeting moment where the old Mary, the Mary who would have jumped to solve everyone else's problems, almost took over, but then I remembered the scorn in Linda's voice, the lack of support from Jack, and I knew what I had to say. 
Linda, it's not my responsibility to bail you out. You and Jack made your choices, just as I made mine, and for the first time in years, I'm choosing myself. The line went quiet for a few seconds before Linda finally spoke. So, that's it then. You're turning your back on your family. You turned your back on me long before I ever walked away, I replied before hanging up. In that moment, I felt a sense of closure I hadn't realized I needed. It was as if the final piece of a complicated puzzle had clicked into place, allowing me to see the complete picture for the first time. And what I saw was a woman who had grown stronger through adversity, who had reclaimed her autonomy, and who had no room in her life for those who would undermine her. The fallout from my marriage and the choices I made afterward had far-reaching consequences, not just for me, but for the very people who drove me away. While I thrived in my new environment, they suffered the natural results of their actions. My phone buzzed with new messages from Jack and Linda over the next few weeks, but I left them unread. I was too busy living my life, forging new relationships and repairing old ones to bother with the specters of my past. And as I focused on crafting this new chapter of my life, I knew one thing for certain. My story was far from over, and this time, I wouldn't let anyone else write it for me. Months rolled by like chapters in a book you can't put down, each one more engaging than the last. My career continued to flourish, and I even earned a promotion that came with an office overlooking the city. The view was poetic in a way. I could see far and wide, much like the new perspective I had on life. Sarah and I became close, and we made it a tradition to have a girls' night out every two weeks. During one of these outings, Sarah paused and looked at me with earnest eyes. You seem happier, Mary. Lighter, even. I thought about it for a moment and smiled. I am, Sarah. For the first time in years, I feel like I'm living for myself, not just reacting to the circumstances or people around me. That's wonderful, she said, lifting her glass. Here's to living your best life. To living my best life, I echoed, and we clinked glasses. However, it wasn't all roses. I had moments of doubt, moments when I wondered if I had made the right choices. I also had to grapple with societal expectations. Even in the 21st century, a divorced woman is often looked at differently. During a family dinner, my own aunt couldn't help but ask, so Mary, any prospects? You know you're not getting any younger. Actually, Aunt Clara, I'm quite content with where I am right now, I answered, a polite smile fixed on my face. But don't you get lonely, she pressed on. I have a fulfilling job, great friends, and a life that makes me happy. That's more than enough for me, I said, putting an end to that line of questioning. It wasn't long before news reached me that Jack had gotten a job as a night shift security guard. Linda, too, had started working part-time at a department store. Both were undoubtedly humbling experiences for them. Through mutual acquaintances, I even heard that Jack was attending community college, attempting to build a life separate from his mother. In an unexpected turn of events, Jack reached out to me. Hey, Mary, it's been a while. I've done some thinking, and I know I messed up. Would you be willing to meet? I'd like to apologize in person. The message sat there on my phone screen, a swirl of emotions whirling within me. And then, with a deep breath, I replied, Jack, thank you for the offer, but an apology isn't necessary. We both made choices, and we're both living with the consequences. I wish you well, truly. I put down the phone, pondering the significance of this exchange. It wasn't that I was too proud to meet him or even hear his apology. It was simply that I had moved on. I had built a new life, free from the toxic environment that once held me back. Forgiveness had come, not in words exchanged over a tense coffee meetup, but in the peace I felt when I thought of my past. I'd forgiven, but not forgotten, and that was enough for me.